Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Take Action. You caught me right in the middle of studying. Um, because the Lord was just showing me something as I was reading this, uh, and it's the same thing that I'm going to share with you today. I'm so excited about the word. And we just finished our Easter season, or what some of you will call the resurrection season. And um, I, I, I said just a couple weeks ago that once we get to this place where we are post-resurrection, it's like we stop talking about Jesus altogether. And I want to keep the conversation going because there's so much wrapped around the history of Jesus getting out of the grave on that third day morning with all power in his hand. There is so much for us to discuss, and I want to discuss just a small portion of something uh, that took place in and around the resurrection season. Some of these lessons will be before, uh, some will be after. Um, I also want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for all of those who are continuously uh, in Mighty Network and online submitting your, um, oh my, I don't even know what to call them, your, your reports, your miracle reports, your testimonies, your excitement, your gratitude. Oh, and by the way, just got word again that the United States is getting ready to, re uh, to release even more student loan forgiveness. <laughs> we prophesied this one week before it was made public in the year 2023, October was the month. And then all of a sudden, the Lord started opening up the windows of heaven, pouring out blessings that we don't have room enough to receive. And as of this past weekend, we were at nearly $61 million in debt elimination and cancellation, all to the glory of God. I want you to be a part of that. So our team is getting ready to put up some sort of link or code where you can actually go yourself and submit your miracle report. That doesn't mean that you're submitting a receipt asking us to pay it. It means that you're submitting what God is doing or prayer request for what you would like God to do so that way we can celebrate you when God brings it to your life. We're pretty, pretty excited about what God is doing. $39 million to go. And we've got a lot of months to do it. So I'm going to put this in the atmosphere right now. I'm really believing God for overflow. I'm really believing that we're going to surpass our $100 million mark of debt cancellation. Can you imagine what you will be able to do with your life and in your finances and with your future when your bills are no longer an issue? I'm believing that God's going to do it, and I need you to believe with me. Let's go to Mark chapter 14, verse 51 and 52. Mark chapter 14, verse 51 and 52. The Bible says in Mark chapter 14, verse 51, and there followed him a young, a certain young man, a certain young man, having a linen cloth about his naked body, and the young men laid hold of him. Verse 52 says, and he left the linen cloth and fled, from them naked. Those two verses, to somebody who's not even locked in right now, you're like, what are we talking about? A naked boy, linen, I don't see the salvific um, uh, conversation. Well, we're going to talk about it. I'm going to tag this with a, a, a label so that way you can find it online. Uh, it's called Naked and Afraid. That's what we're going to talk about today, Naked and Afraid. Now, just by a show of your virtual hand, how many of you all watch the show Naked and Afraid? It's a good show. Um, it's something my wife and I, we watch it all the time. I believe we've probably seen every episode of every season. And um, for those of you all who don't watch, it's just a show about two people who are placed in the middle of an adverse circumstance, sometimes extreme cold, sometimes extreme heat, sometimes extreme humidity. Uh, sometimes they put you on islands where there's no fresh water and you have to dig for it. But you're basically naked and afraid. And the only thing they give you is a bag or a pouch. And in it is two tools that you selected before um, production started. Uh, most people choose according to the environment. So if they are in, um, say, for instance, a jungle, then one of the tools they will pick is a mosquito net to keep the bugs off of them. Let me tell you, 
naked and afraid, y'all ought to be ashamed of yourself because the mosquito nets don't work. Them people be bit up. All right, that's number one. Number two, most people pick a fire starter. Just something with flint that you can strike to make sure that you can start a fire in an environment. You find some dried out wood, you, you can start a fire there. The third thing that you see people pick is a water pot. Why? Because if you can start a fire and you have a water pot, then you can boil the water and, and make healthy water out of infested water. So there goes on and on. People pick knives and, and axes. It, it depends on the environment. The tool that you choose depends on the environment you're in. You wouldn't pick a mosquito net if they put you in an Arctic tundra. Uh, so you have to pick the tool for the environment. So let's just put that aside. Now, just about the time Jesus was finished healing the man um, with the ear of the servant of the high priest, um, the Bible says in the Gospel of Mark, tells us about a naked young man who was found in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is the place where Jesus was when he was praying. Uh, I've been to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Bible talks about, I want you to think about this. This is why for every believer, if you get an opportunity to, if you get a chance to, if you have the resources, and maybe I'll sponsor a trip, but we should go to Jerusalem. We should go to the Holy Land and see it. I was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'm, I'm thinking about this differently, okay? Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's, he's praying or whatever he's doing. He's sitting down. So I get in the Garden of Gethsemane, and there are olives all on the ground. I get down on my knees to pray, and all of a sudden, I feel a pinch, and then another pinch, and then the third pinch all around my right ankle, and did not realize that in the Garden of Gethsemane, there are these fire ants that are crawling around, eating the olives. So I just want you to think about the fact that if Jesus was in that garden and he was praying, I want you to think about him being surrounded and bitten and stung by these fire ants or whatever was there at the time, out in the elements, whether it was hot or cold. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Betrayal is all around him. Uh, uh, you've got a murderous plot all around him. And at the time of our text in Mark, we see a naked young man who was found in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you've ever read this text, and if you have not, and maybe this is your first time hearing it, you should be asking yourself, who is this young man? Whose child is he? And why is he naked? I mean... I want you to think about this. A naked young man walking in a cemetery, in a garden, I should say, in the garden of Gethsemane. I want you to think about it. And he did come from a cemetery. I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll catch up. But I want you to imagine a young man. I'm going to pick an age. Let's say he's 10. Okay, well, number one, <clears throat> we're talking about a young man who has caused his family a great deal of pain because he's dead. Okay. Who knows what he died from? Maybe a disease. Uh, maybe maybe a blunt force trauma to the head. Who knows what he died from? But there's a young man that's dead. He's in a cemetery. And all of a sudden, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, who is there praying or fasting or whatever he's doing, he's being followed by a young, naked young man. I don't know about you, but if I go outside, and I see a young, naked young man, not only am I going the opposite direction, I'm calling the police because that's not a circumstance anybody wants to be caught in. You have to imagine where Jesus is psychologically seeing this young, naked man walking up on him. Not only is he naked, but he's draped in linen cloth. So then the next question I ask myself is not only who is this young man, <clears throat> not only is why is he naked, why does he have normal clothes on? Why doesn't he have normal clothes? Why doesn't he have on the normal clothes of that day? Transpose it today. Why doesn't he have on a pair of jeans and a T-shirt and some shoes and socks and underwear? Why, why is he not properly dressed? And then the next question I ask myself is, why did the Holy Spirit 
take special care to make sure that this story about a young naked man following Jesus with no clothes on and no parental supervision. Why did the Holy Spirit take time to put this in the canon of Scripture? And then the word <clears throat> used for linen cloth is used only in one other event in the entire New Testament, and it is to depict the type of clothing that Jesus had on his body when he was wrapped up and taken in the tomb. Now, that right there should change your mind about the entire conversation. Because this is not a linen outfit that you wear on your favorite cruise. This is not a linen outfit for an all-white party. The word used for linen outfit is the same word used for the linen cloth that Jesus was wrapped in when he was put in the tomb. So what we actually see is a young naked boy walking around with grave clothes on. So then the question still remains, who is he? And then I believe the answer to that question lies in the cloth. You see, in those days when a body was prepared for burial, it was wrapped in a certain linen cloth. That body was washed, and that body was ceremonially cleansed and prepared for burial naked and then wrapped in linen cloth. Furthermore, I want you to look at this, and we're going to get into the text. It's almost done. Furthermore, the location where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, right, and I've seen it. When you stand in the Garden of Gethsemane, you can see it. Right on the other side of the garden, on the other side of the mountain, towards the base of the mountain, you see these huge concrete blocks. You know why? Because it is a cemetery. There is a cemetery. So right where Jesus is, there is a naked boy, listen to me, <laughs> who's naked and afraid, wrapped in linen clothes, the same linen clothes that Jesus was wrapped in when he died, following Jesus, and it just so happens that the direction the boy comes from <clears throat> is a cemetery. I, I don't even know if y'all with me right now. You're going you're gonna to miss the whole sermon because you're not listening. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If you hear what I'm saying, just put something in the chat and say, spit it out, pastor. Hurry up, get to it. Naked boy, wrapped in grave clothes, same clothes Jesus was in, in a location right near a cemetery. All right, now let's place this here. Team, bring up John chapter 18, verse 4 through 6. John chapter 18, verse 4 through 6 says, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come up on him, went forth and said unto them, whom are you seeking? In other words, who are you looking for? Verse 5, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. You're looking for me, and I'm right here. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. Look at the next verse. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backwards and fell to the ground. Okay. So, so they, are, they are in the area where Jesus is. Jesus has just gotten up from the grave. He asked them, who are they looking for? They say, we are looking for Jesus. And Jesus says, I am. And when he said that, they fell backwards and they hit the ground. Oh, God, this is so good. Because when Jesus said, I am, the power of his words were released. Listen to me. And the power of his words were so, were so powerful and when they were released that it knocked the soldiers backwards to the ground. Can I tell you what the Lord just showed me? I have talked your ear off for 10 plus minutes to get you to this place. 
Let me say it again because I feel like I'm the only one excited in our virtual room. Jesus says, who are you looking for? They said, we're looking for Jesus. Jesus says, you're looking at him. They fell backwards. Jesus knew who he was even when they did not. And when he told them who he was, they fell to the ground. And the Lord told me to tell you, never underestimate the power of knowing who you are. When you know who you are, everything has to back up off you. I feel that. <laughs> see, see, see y'all didn't, didn't come ready to church. Y'all did not come ready today. I came ready for you. If I don't say anything else to you, I should have just said enough that ought to put the power of God in your spirit. They said, who are you? I'm Jesus. They fell back. Never underestimate the power of knowing who you are. When you know who you are, poverty will back off of you. When you know who you are, sickness will back off of you. When you know who you are, grief will back up off of you. When you know who you are, heartbreak has to release you. When you know who you are, depression has to back off of you. Never underestimate knowing who you are. I don't care if you just got out of poverty. I don't care if you just got out of the grave. I don't care if you just got out of a bad relationship. Never go through anything without coming out knowing who you are. I have learned who I am. Just somebody just type in the chat, I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. That means when I don't have money, I know I'm rich. That, that means that when, when I'm single, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not desperate. I'm just a person in wait. I know who I am. I'm a joint heir of the king. I am the head and not the tail. I am above. I am never beneath. I am the lender. I am not the borrower. And it is not depicting on my circumstances. It does not matter what state I'm in. I am blessed and highly favored. I'll say like Coach Don Staley said, uncommon favor. You got to know who you are. You got to know what God is doing in your life. And let me tell you, there is nothing more powerful in the earth aside from the power of God. There is nothing more powerful than knowing your identity. Somebody just shouted again, I know who I am. You will be surprised and how many things will start to fall off of you when you start to know who you are. So evidently when Jesus said, I know who I am, I am, I am, I am that I am, it must, this is the only way they could have fallen, Billy, it must have caused an earthquake. This is, his, his word was so powerful, he said, I am. And the earth said, I understand. And the earth begins to shake. Oh, my God. So what happens when the earth shakes? I wish I could get up and, and show you. What happens when the earth shakes? Do you remember what's on the other side of the garden? A cemetery. <laughs> Jesus says, I am. The earth shakes. What's at the foot of the place where he is? A cemetery. If you've ever seen um, a cemetery in Jerusalem or Israel, they bury their bodies above the ground in concrete enclosures. So when Jesus says, I am, it causes an earthquake and the Richter scale must have been off the charts because it was able to reach the cemetery at the bottom of the mountain that Jesus was on, which was the Mountain of Olives. Toward the base of the place where he was was a cemetery. The graves in that place must have broken open and out comes crawling a young man who's wrapped in grave clothes. He's wrapped in linen. So when Jesus says, I am, the earth shakes, one or many of the graves break open, a young man is resurrected because Jesus said, I am. That explains 
why a young man is naked and in grave clothes because when the earthquake happened, a grave opens up, a young man comes out, and the reason why he's following Jesus is because he wants to get close to the man who resurrected him. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. Because when Jesus got up, he also got you up. And I don't know who I'm talking to, that when Jesus says, all power is in my hand, and he got out of that grave, he was talking to you too. And I come up against anybody who believes that you have permission to stay in your grave position. Crawl out of your hole. Crawl out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Crawl out of that depression. I don't care if you're naked and afraid. I want you to come to the cross, and I need you to get in the presence of the one who speaks and all things are well. I need somebody to type in the chat, he is, therefore I am. I know it's a lot, but it's worth the affirmation. He is, therefore I am. He is power, therefore I am powerful. He is a way maker, that way I can find the way. He is finances, that way I can be the righteousness of God and have wealth and have no sorrow. Everything that God is, I became at the resurrection, and when that young man crawled out of that grave, he followed Jesus because he wanted to get a glimpse of the resurrection himself. You and I are in this place today, this virtual place, under the power of a God who can speak those things that are not as though they were. And I want you, whether you're naked or afraid, to make up in your mind today that as you hear the voice of God coming through my mouth, that this is your call to crawl out of your grave, whether you're naked, whether you are afraid, whether you're poor, whether you're rich, whether you're lonely, whether you have company, whether you're employed, whether you're underemployed, whether you just got a repossession or you just walked off the lot and signed the paper, I speak right now that at the voice of the prophet, by the word of God, that God has given you permission to come out of the deep, dark crevice and the hole you're in, whether you're naked or afraid, and to come get a glimpse, not of the one who resurrected, but a glimpse of the resurrection. And watch what the Bible says. When the soldiers saw the young man who was following Jesus, they tried to apprehend him. They tried to grab him, right? It's, well, he, he, must, he must be a danger. He must be a lunatic. You, you know, we read the Bible and we forget all human logic. What would you do if you were downtown your city and you seen a naked man walking down the street? You're not just going to wave at him and pass him up and say, hey, buddy, how are you today? No, no, you're going to assume that he's addicted to drugs or you're going to make some sort of assumption because it is not normal to see people walking naked. So they tried to apprehend him. But when they reached out to grab him, ooh, help me, Holy Ghost. I ain't got nobody to talk to in here. I want you to think about what I'm getting ready to say, and I'm done. I'm done. You can, you can push two minutes on your microwave because you're about to eat. I'm done. You, you can go ahead and turn the oven on. You can call the kids from upstairs because I know you didn't want them around you when you were watching this or wherever you are. I'm done when I tell you this next powerful revelation that the Lord showed me. They want to go grab this. The Bible doesn't say that a grown man got out of the tomb. It was a naked young boy. We have assumed that he's somewhere between 10 and 12. These are soldiers, grown, trained men who are trying to grab a boy and apprehend him because he looks suspect. And the Bible says that he broke free from their grip. And then the Lord told me to tell you, do you not know that if the grave couldn't hold you, they can't either. <laughs> if I can get out of this depression, can't nobody depress me again. If I get 
out of this circumstance, nobody will lock me, down, lock me down again. If I get out of this with my head and my heart, I'm not going to be gripped by anybody else. Just say this to yourself. If my situation couldn't hold me, no person can. I don't want you to spend the rest of your life talking about your haters holding you back. I don't want you talking about people from other religions holding you back. No nationality. Listen, if, if the grave couldn't hold you back, if slavery couldn't hold you back, if, if, if the abortion couldn't hold you back, if, if, the, if the molestation couldn't hold you back, if the rape didn't hold you back, if the trauma didn't hold you back, if the learning disability can't hold you back, then no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. If the situation can't hold you back, then the people can't. He was naked and he was afraid but at least he was free. And I speak to you today in the name of Jesus, whether you're watching this in the daytime, whether you're watching this uh, in the night, whether you're watching it live, whether you're watching it recorded, whether you're watching it at work, whether you're watching it at home, whether you have tears in your eyes or whether you have joy, unspeakable joy, I come to tell you that God said that freedom is about to be all around you. You may be naked, and afraid, but there is a freedom that is coming, and it was worth fighting for, it was worth fasting for, because God is about to free you from that dark place. And it's going to be at his word. And you don't have to flip through the pages of the scripture to find out what that word is. I'm giving it to you right now. The word of the Lord is, you're free. Come get a glimpse of the resurrection. Get a glimpse of the one who hung high and was buried low that you might be the righteousness of God and that with the word, he can speak to your grave and you can come forward. Even the Bible says that when Lazarus was brought out of the tomb, Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. The old preacher would say, the reason why Jesus had to call Lazarus by name is because his voice is so powerful that if he had just said, get up, everybody who was dead that day would have gotten up. So let me tell you, this resurrection is for you. I want you to type your name in the chat and after you finish putting your name in the chat, I want you to simply say these two words. Get up. Get up. Get up out of your depression. Get up out of your rejection. Get up out of your feelings. Get up. Get up. Get up. You've got to get closer to the resurrection. You've got to get up. There's a new job waiting on you. Get up. Bishop Noel Jones said, you can't lose your mind over what you lost because you're going to need your mind for what God's about to send. Get up. Naked and afraid. Wrapped in your linen cloth. Get up. When Lazarus was in his linen cloth, imagine he was hopping towards Jesus because his feet were bound and his hands were bound. And Jesus says to the men who were surrounding him, Loose him and let him go. We speak to the forces of evil and darkness, to my sons and daughters and friends who are watching me by way of take action in this broadcast. I say to every demon, warlock, witch, and soothsayer, loose them and let them go and go into the pits of hell. You will not find another host here you are banished by the power of the Holy Ghost to enter anybody who's under the unction of the Holy Ghost at this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, hallelujah and amen. Listen, friends, I love you so much that I will spend every day studying to give you something that will make your life 1% better. We always say here at the Lighthouse Church and at Take Action, give us 1% of your trust, we'll earn the other 99. Give us one year of your life, we'll do our best to change it. Thank you. To those of you all who are watching us on YouTube, thank you to those of you uh, who are connected to us through Mighty Network. Thank you for those who attend one of our four 
uh, in-person campuses. And thank you for our global audience who watches us all over the world. You are all so appreciated. We're getting ready to give right now. And while you're getting your gift ready, um, they're putting instructions up on the screen right now. And I want to tell you about two things that we did with Take Action this week. Um, so, and I do this so that grace will abound to your account. I'm always looking for people to help. I, you know, I, I believe that you should give um, and you don't do it to be seen, but I also think that I have to be accountable to you to let you know what I am doing as we are taking care of people with the hard-earned resources that you've entrusted me with. And to this day, I say it proudly, um, and I will until the last breath is in my body, I am a good steward over what you give. You should come, you should come to Houston one day to see um, what God has given us. It's, it does it no justice with you just looking at me on, on the stage. We've got hundreds of thousands uh, of square feet of building space in our four campuses. We've got acres and acres and acres of land. And, and even right now, um, as I am producing this to you, we have upgraded the way. I just had a conversation with our producer. We're upgrading uh, our, our production quality to make sure that it's coming to you in a palatable format um, and, and, and quickly working on being able to get these messages translated into different languages. So it all costs, and, and when you help us, we're able to do it. Uh, as you're getting ready to give, let me tell you two things we did. Here in Houston, Texas, uh, they are uh, opening up um, a gospel heritage African-American museum that's going to celebrate uh, the history of African-American gospel music. And this city is so rich with it. And on behalf of Take Action, uh, yesterday, uh, my wife and I, we donated a $5,000 uh, stipend uh, to the foundation to be able to buy the land and to get the building um, that is needed to house this museum. And let me tell you, I got word yesterday uh, from good friends V. Michael McKay and Yolanda Adams that the building has been secured. The building has been secured. Uh, the city and the government is in lockstep to make sure that this museum uh, can uh, be brought to fruition to, to just honor the legacy and preserve the legacy of African American uh, uh, influence on gospel music and culture. Number two, uh, we had a, uh, a minister of our church uh, Pastor Matthew Davis, who went out and started a church called the Blueprint Church. And we're praying that God continues to bless his ministry and his church. Uh, and the Lord gave me the unction right in service on Sunday uh, to, to offer $5,000 to their ministry to help them to continue to build. I only remember when we started and we were not surrounded by anybody who could help us. And I vowed that if God ever put me in a position of privilege, I would help those who are on the move. And so, Pastor Matthew, uh, we spoke yesterday. I'm proud of you. God bless you and your ministry. We pray nothing but God's blessed for your life, and you can look forward to those of us here at Take Action blessing you as well. Thank you so much for helping me spread the gospel. Thank you so much for being a part of this movement. We'll see you again next week on Take Action. God bless you. Hey, everybody. My name is Pastor Keon Henderson. I am the founder of an organization called Take Action Now. People are always direct messaging me and texting me and saying, Pastor, what are you doing? How can I be a part of what you're doing? And I know everybody doesn't wanna be a part of the local church, but what if I told you I had a way for you to partner with me so that we can affect change throughout the world? Hence, Take Action Now, a 501c3 nonprofit organization committed to advancing individual agency and social progress by protecting, strengthening, and uplifting the underserved and disenfranchised throughout the world. We're doing humanitarian things, teaching entrepreneurism, teaching home ownership, and institutional inequities, cultural deficits. We have our ear to the ground, and we need your help to make a difference. Whether it is making a sizable donation uh, to the estate of a young woman who lost her battle with cancer via the internet, and we were able to make a difference there, or whether it is in a underserved community in the Caribbean islands where the children were playing amidst rocks and glass, and we came in and broke ground recently on a park so that athletes and cheerleaders and young people in that community can have a safe place to stir up the gift inside of them, 
whether it is paying the utility bills in cold climates for seniors or just helping basketball players get the proper uniforms of football players. It's just us making a difference through financial literacy and technological empowerment and mentoring services. This is what we do. And all I'm asking you to do is become a partner with me right now. And I want you to go visit takeactionnow.org. Don't put off for tomorrow what you can do today. Thank you.